Only it's his breath that's in my lungs. Just praise God for his awesome, powerful. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for what God is going to do next in our lives. So much going off in India. And, you know, I, I, I totally agree with Samuel. This is a collective thing. We're all on the same team. Might be in different locations, but we're together. We're on a journey together. We're serving God together. Why? To see God's kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. To see his kingdom come. To see his name lifted up. To see his name glorified. To see him lifted high. King of kings. Lord of lords. Amen. Well, look, I won't take up any more of uh, the five minutes that Nikki's got left. <laughs> but look, let's welcome Nikki up to bring the word of God and just give a good, warm welcome. Praise God and the word that is placed upon your. It's already turned on. You're okay with that? Have to on or is it no, no, Ryan controls oh, that. Control. You. You're oh, in. Right, that's excellent. Yeah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It's been a long time. The world has changed. I'm not sure for the better. I've had, I, I must admit, I had days when I wondered if I'd ever get back again. Um, but I've had a lot of time to sit on my roof and talk to the Lord. And God has said some really interesting things to me. So I'm going to share one thing he said, which might surprise you. I hope it does. We're, we're going to look at a scripture. You know, the Bible's full of pictures. And a story in the Old Testament can have hidden in it something that reveals something that will happen later. The Bible calls them shadows. It talks in um, Hebrews about the law being a shadow of the good things to come. And the Old Testament laws and the sacrifices are all a picture of the ministry of Jesus, the good thing to come. And so sometimes when I'm studying the scripture, God says something to me and it gets me thinking. I think, well, I've never, I never thought of that. And throughout all of this, you know, going nowhere, sitting on my roof, I, I've, been, I've been preaching in England um, to my church uh, from my bedroom. And dabbing myself with the towel as it gets hotter and hotter. And they, they, they were saying to me on Sunday when we were there last week, oh, you looked so hot. It's like, yep, it's very hot. But I was asked to preach one day, and it was sort of a little bit sudden. And, and I like a little bit of time to meditate and, you know, chew over the word. And I thought, okay, Lord, what am I going to say? And immediately, God shouted the scripture at me. And when he does that, I think, oh, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. And he said, there arose a king who did not know Joseph. Uh -huh. mm, can you choose an easier one? What am I going to say about that? So let's go to it in Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1 and verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falls out any war, they join with our enemies and fight against us and get them up out of the land. Therefore, they set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh's treasure cities, Python and Ramesses, and they afflicted them more and more, and so it goes on. So my first thought was, well, okay, Lord, you're going to have to talk to me about this, because what has this got to do with any of us? And the Lord said to me, there are three sorts of people in the church today. What are they? He said... There are people who want everything to go back to normal. I thought, yep, that's me, Lord. Let's go back to normal so we can go out and carry on and I can go home and see my family and, and friends. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm one of them, Lord. And he said, there is a second group who are looking back and they want to recreate the past. 
Now, how many people here would love to have a, a, a Wesleyan revival? How many want to see, you know, the, the, the city crowd gathering to hear the preaching of the gospel and thousands getting saved? Wouldn't you like to hear that? Yeah, I'm one of them. I'd like to see that. And he said, there are people who are looking forward for what is to come. And I thought, yeah, okay, I'm looking forward for what is to come. Trouble is, I don't really know what that is. And if we look too far forward, it gets a little scary, doesn't it? And COVID has made us all the more scared about what is to come. And so this story in scripture of Israel's deliverance from Egypt shows us a picture. I'm going to show you some similarities to today. And I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be excited because this is victory. This is what we are looking forward to. We've got to stop looking back to a Wesleyan revival because it's not coming. We're not going back to the days of Finney and, and all those great preachers who collected the crowds and how they did it without microphones and, and all that we have, I don't know. So let's take a look at there arose a king who knew not Joseph because there are parallels to what is happening today. Now, Christianity has done really well since the resurrection. The Holy Spirit has done a great job. You know, since Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has done a great job. When Israel went down into Egypt, there was a group of them. 70 to be precise. And you know, they went down into Egypt with tremendous power and influence. They got given Goshen, the best of the land to live in, and they were the saviors of Egypt. That's what they were. They saved Egypt from destruction because of the famine that was coming and the answers that Joseph had. And Egypt was saved by these people. So, of course, they are highly respected, highly privileged. And they stay 400 years. And by the time we come to the end of the 400 years, we've got a nation of slaves with no power, but there are more of them than anyone else. That's what they're worried about. Here's an interesting thing. The 12 disciples, the 120 on the day of Pentecost, affected the whole world, and mostly the Western world. We have a, a Christian heritage which we don't fully appreciate the power of because we live with it. I grew up with it. But living in India has told me that, you know, we have a foundation that is worth more than you can put a price on because they don't have it in India. And it shows. But of course, if we look at the world for a minute, the largest group of believers are the Christians. Did you know that? The biggest group of believers are the Christians of one group. The second largest are the Muslims and the third group is made up of the communists and the Hindus, which is a very interesting combination. <laughs> but the Christians are the biggest group. And yet we have become the most despised in spite of our tremendous past. Now, why am I saying that? Because it has a bearing on what is coming. It has a bearing on how things will go. Now, it says here that the Egyptians decided they were going to have to deal cleverly with these people. Why? Because they're outnumbered. We're going to have to be clever. We're going to have to find a way of controlling or it's going to be a problem. And it's interesting that they, the biggest worry was that Israel would leave. Because, of course, when Israel goes down into Egypt, the plan is we're going out again. And the aim is to stop them leaving. We don't want them to leave. We want to keep them because they're useful to us. 
And Christians are useful. They do a good job. Christians do a very good job, but we've got to be clever. And the world, the Western world now, with the exception of our great queen, who, you know, is not going to be around for too much longer, we have leaders who know not Joseph. The leaders do not know Jesus Christ. We are surrounded by them. Look at the Western world's leaders. They don't know Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ is where it all started. And the greatness, Britain's greatness, came from preaching the gospel. The empire came from preaching the gospel. And when we stopped preaching the gospel, the empire stopped being a necessity to God. And it all fell apart. The leaders don't know Jesus Christ. The king of Egypt did not know Joseph. So there's a different mindset. Let's be clever. Now, the world has been very clever with us. The leaders who don't know Joseph have done a great job of preparing us for what is to come. Well, what they think is to come is certainly not what God has intended. So the numbers have changed. The biggest group of people now have the least influence, and I'm sure you've noticed how it is very much stacked against the Christian. Very much stacked against the Christian. We become the, mi the minority in power but the majority in number. And it's interesting, you talk to people on the street, an awful lot of people in Britain have an underlying sense that we are Christian. Maybe they're not, they're not born again. But this underlying sense, that's our foundation. But out there at the top, let's do away with it. Let's get away with it. So what did they do to deal wisely with the Egyptian, with the with the Jews? It says they employed taskmasters. Now, my picture of a taskmaster is, you know, if you watch the Ten Commandments, they have these little men with the big whip, don't they, beating the slaves and making them, you know, do the job. And, and in my mind, I, that's what I thought a taskmaster was. It was those people that went around forcing the slaves to do their job. So I thought, hey, I think I'll just look up the word and see what it means, what we're really talking about here. And the taskmasters were, first of all, people to create burdens for them, create problems, create pressures. They were to make them do things. So the taskmasters were the enforcers of pay the taxes, obey the rules. You know, what we would call petty officials who go around trying to make you comply with things you don't believe in. The demand that we've got to submit to what is not always spiritually correct. And at the end of all of that, their aim was to reduce their numbers and control their activities. And so we have the, the, the part where they decide they will kill all the baby boys to try and reduce the numbers. And they culminate in the, let's not give them any straw. Now, the straw is an interesting um, thing to consider. The bricks are made with clay. And, you know, they, they don't have modern kilns and modern facilities. And, and it's quite interesting because where we live, people make bricks in the fields. The, the bricks are created. You see them, they set fire to these big piles of things. And, you know, the bricks are rubbish bricks, I have to say. You drop them, they fall apart. They're not like British bricks, you know, that are fired in kilns and things. They, they are, you know, they need a bit of straw in them, really. And the straw is what held them together. It made better bricks. So the fact that they did a good job was because they had the straw. So we take away from you what enables you to do a good job. Now, let's just for one moment think of what has been taken away from us so we can't do a good job. Because this will surprise you, but it is the truth. The church, the Christians, have changed the world. I, I find it interesting. Have you noticed how there's a lot of talk at the moment about slavery and our past disgraceful behavior about slavery, which was disgraceful, 
is unjustifiable. But have you noticed the bit they've left out? They don't tell you. You see, we've got this great move. Oh, we need reparations. We've got to penalise. We've got to challenge. We've got to root up and pull down. Britain was responsible for abolishing slavery in the world. The British Empire ceased to participate in it. And do you know what? The man who did it was a Christian. And that's why you won't hear about it in spite of everything. We can shout. We can make a noise. But do you know what? It was the Christians that stopped it. But that bit doesn't, we don't hear that bit, do we? So what about the straw? What did the church have that has been taken away from it? And it's been very cleverly done. Because people say, well, what's the use of the church? I was a pointless organization. What do you do? What does the church do? It's out of date. Do you know, the church of Jesus Christ worldwide has been responsible for housing the homeless, caring for the sick, helping the needy, housing people, feeding people, doing all of the things that no longer belong to the church, they belong to the government now. Because the very power that the church had was it was responsible for all of those things. And now we stand around, we think, well, what are we going to do? We need to get involved in society. But have you noticed there's a lot of reasons you can't do anything? Because you've got to have this, you've got to organize like that, you're not allowed to do this. There are very many rules and regulations, but social housing, care for the sick, care for the elderly, care for the homeless, care for the dysfunctional, all of them, every single one of those things started in the church. And they've taken them all away and made them the priority and the prerogative of the state. Very clever. They've taken the straw out of our bricks. That's what they've done. The straw has been taken out of the bricks. So now we've got a beautiful building. We sing songs. We try and be kind. And everyone says you're prejudiced and you're narrow-minded and you're this or you're that. And the power, the straw's gone. And what we want is to go back to the way it was before. And God says we're not going back. We're going forward. We're going forward. Now, I hope you're not worried or upset. Because when you talk about some things, people start to get worried. But you know what? This is our greatest victory. And I believe we're heading for our finest hour. Our finest hour is coming. And this story in Exodus tells you exactly what is going to happen. So I'm going to tell you. Now, we know that Moses goes back because God has sent him. And he goes in to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says... Why should I? Who are you? Oh, you've got too much time on your hands. Let's make it more difficult for you. And so we enter into this period of the plagues, the famous ten plagues. The plagues are very interesting, and there is something you need to remember about them. And the picture is here, and the picture matters for us today. The first three plagues come. The first one is, there's a test here. What was the first plague? What was the first plague? Oh, you know you were coming for a test today, didn't you? <laughs> exactly. The first plague was the water turned into blood. The first plague is the water turns into blood. The second plague, anybody know what the second one was? Frogs. The frogs come. And it specifically says the frogs were in the beds, were in the ovens, were in the houses. It goes through a whole list of unpleasant places you'll find the frogs. And the third plague was lice. And a point is made at the third plague. When the lice come, the magicians of Egypt can't do it. The magicians of Egypt can turn water into blood, they can produce frogs, but they can't make lice. And that is an interesting picture. And then, before the next plague, 
important words are spoken. Goshen and Israel are separated and they don't suffer the rest of the plagues. Now that's interesting, isn't it? Even when God sends darkness, there is light in Goshen. So the Jews, the, the Israel, are separated from the trouble. There's a little bit of trouble at the beginning, but they miss the major part of it. And we don't hear about them again until the end. So let's think about the first three plagues because they concern us. The first one is the water turning into blood. Water in scripture is a picture of spiritual truth, the, 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 the water of the spirit, and it is corrupted. The biggest obstacle we face, the church faces, is corruption of spiritual truth. Today, you, everything goes. We don't want the truth. We want the truth that appeals to us. Society has made spiritual truth unacceptable or out of date. The purity of spiritual truth that we have is a huge obstacle, is it not? Um, I, I go over to Holland, and Holland is one of the most liberal countries in Europe. And the pastor I go to over there, Evo, he says, do you know what? He says, it is so hard to preach the gospel here because society is so liberal. There is no level of spiritual truth that people really want to listen to or accept because they see everything that we preach as a restriction on their liberty. The corruption of... Are we, have you seen corruption of truth? I mean, we're seeing corruption of, you know, basic facts now, never mind truth. But spiritually, there are so many errors, so many things working against the church. It is very hard to maintain the truth of the scriptures. The second plague is frogs. And in scripture, frogs are unclean animals. Perversion, evil. And we are seeing a multiplication of madness that is contrary to the truth. I mean, some of the things that have been presented in the last few years, I, can't, I couldn't have even imagined them 10 years ago. Perversion, the multiplication of unclean things, things that are now acceptable that at one time were extremely unacceptable. We all can think of probably 20 or 30 things we've heard that you think, oh my goodness, what is the world coming to? There is a multiplication of uncleanness, things that are unholy, ungodly, and untrue. But the third one is lice. What are lice? Lice are an irritation. You get lice? We have a head lice in India. It's a big problem. Oh, my goodness. Nits all the time. Irritation. Irritating. And the world has become a difficult place to live in. There are more and more things done to challenge us, upset us, stress us. And the interesting thing is this is the plague where the line is drawn and the magicians can't make lice. The world's troubles are out of man's control now. When I was a kid, we used to have acid rain. Does anybody remember the acid rain? And it used to kill the trees, didn't it? And they eliminated it. They made some changes and they modified it. And, and you don't hear about acid rain anymore. Well, not in, not in Britain anyway. And, um, but now what you hear about is this, this global problem with the environment. What are we going to do? Do you know what? Nobody knows what to do. Do you know what it says in Romans? In Romans, it says the whole earth groans and travails, waiting for the coming of Jesus Christ. What we are seeing is the groaning and travailing of the earth for the coming of Jesus Christ. The whole earth. And do you know, I used to read that years ago and think, well, what, what, how's the earth going to groan and travail? What does that mean? But we're hearing it. It's being fed to us. And man no longer can do anything about it. So what is next? Then... We enter into the period of this story where Israel is separated. 
and all the bad things that come only come on Egypt. Now, be encouraged by that because you know what? The church will be saved in the midst of trouble. It will be. We should not be afraid of these things. We should be ready for them because in the midst of trouble, God will save us. And so the church is removed until we come to the end. And I want us to just think about the end for a minute. What are you looking for? What's the, you know, today we remember Pentecost. Pentecost is a most incredible day. It's one of those days in church history, in the history of God's people, not just the church, but going back to Israel. It is one of those notable days. What's next? What's the next notable day? What's coming next? Do you know the coming of Jesus is the next notable day? The return of Jesus Christ is the next notable event. And do you know what? We are looking for it. It's coming. It's coming. What are we building up to? We're not building up to disaster. We're building up to the coming of Jesus. And do you know what? There's got to be an expectation, a little bit of excitement. You could see it happen. Oh, but what a day. I spent my whole life waiting for the coming of Jesus. And, you know, it's getting exciting. I'll tell you something I have noticed during this COVID, and that is that all over the world, different places, people are talking about the coming of Jesus in a way they never have before. And, you know, there's always been the what I call the mad people. You know, for my whole Christian life, there's been the mad people who do nothing but talk about the coming of Jesus Christ. And they have numerous theories and plans. And I lived next door to a lady who was like that when I was a kid, and it was, like, terrifying. You know, the, it had rained, there'd be a thunderstorm. Oh, it's the vials of God. And I'm thinking, oh, no, what's coming next? You know, it was just a, short, a big thunderstorm, basically. But um, there the, 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 the were always the mad people. But what I've noticed now is it's not the mad people. It's the people who know the scriptures that are talking about the coming of Jesus Christ. And so we come to this point. Now, the last plague, the death of the firstborn. Momentous event. The angel of death passes over. And all of Israel are saved. So let me ask you a question. Now think. I want you to think, because you've got to think. What were Israel doing the day before the last plague? The plague's coming. What are they doing? What are they doing? Because let's face it, they haven't participated in any of the plagues after the third one. They are now at this point where they are getting involved. What are they doing the day before the angel of death passes over? Making bricks? Mm, no, they're doing a bit more than that. What are they doing? Putting the blood on the... Yeah, absolutely. The blood is going on the doorposts. We're, we're bringing the sacrificial lambs. We're preparing for the Passover. Yes. But what does it not tell us that they're doing that we know they did? If it was India, I'd say, I'll give, I'll give, a, I'll give a thousand rupee reward to anyone who can tell me. But... Wouldn't mean, wouldn't mean it. No, no. You know, they're, they're not. The day before, this is what they're doing. They're digging up Joseph. They are digging up Joseph the day before. Now, let's understand. When Joseph dies, he makes specific instructions about his bones, doesn't he? And it always intrigued me because when Jacob dies in Egypt, they cart him off back to Machpelah in, in Canaan and they bury him there. Why didn't they cart Joseph back when he died? I mean, he's a great man. No, no, no. Joseph is buried in Egypt and he stays there, but he warns them, when you leave, you take my bones with you. So the day before they're going to leave, they are digging up Joseph. And Joseph leaves first. When Israel leaves the promised land, they follow the bones of Joseph. Now think about it. The dead man comes back to redeem them. 
The dead man comes back to deliver them from what is coming. The dead man returns. Do you know what? Jesus, the dead man, is coming back for us. And we shouldn't be afraid to be excited because he's coming. The dead man is coming back for us. And so whilst we're being crushed, whilst the world is trying to eliminate Christianity, it's doing its business all over the world to try and stop us from proclaiming the truth, from believing the truth, the dead man is coming back. And they may laugh, but they won't be laughing on that day. Because here we have this picture. The dead man returns and he leads them out. And it's a victory. Now, I believe that the, the blank bit in the middle where, you know, Israel doesn't suffer those plagues is a picture of the rapture. The church is separated from the trouble. So many Christians are afraid of what is going to happen. Afraid of the coming of Jesus because they don't know what's going to work out. But I'm telling you, we don't have to worry. Jesus looks after us in the midst of trouble. And he's coming. The dead man is coming back for us. What a day. What a day. You know, aren't you just itching to stand next to someone who's always laughed at you on that day? <laughs> I told you. Do you know, there are, there are some people in your life that you, you just long for Jesus to turn up when you're standing next to them. See, I told you. The dead man. The dead man goes first. If you'd have told that story in Egypt, they probably said you were crazy. We're, gonna, we're going out and we're following the dead man. The dead man will lead us out. Yes, Jesus Christ, the man who everyone says is dead, is coming to take us out. So, you know, there is, there is a real sense of excitement in the spirit of what is coming. Because do you know what we're looking for? We're looking for the next momentous event. We've had the resurrection. We've had the coming of the Holy Spirit. There's only one thing left, and that is the coming of Jesus Christ. And the exciting thing is that you and I could be there to see it. And you might be saying, oh, well, I'm getting on a bit. Will I last? Will I make it? Jesus makes an interesting statement. In one of the parables, when he talks about the fig tree, and he says, this generation will not pass away till all things be completed. And the generation that saw the reforming of Israel are at the end of their life. And who knows? I'm not saying specifically, but you know what? They will see all things fulfilled. Jesus is coming. So what does it mean for us? What are we going to do here and now? Well, I want you to be prepared. What are we prepared for? Trouble. Prepare for difficulties. The world is not going back to how it was. We're not going to get back to normal. Prepare for trouble. Don't be afraid, because you know what? We've read the last page here. We know what's coming. We've read the end of the book. It's going to be good. Prepare for difficulties. Don't be afraid of them. Rejoice. The second thing is, don't fail to pray and to worship. And God has emphasized this to me considerably. Do you know what? The church has been silenced. We have been silenced in collective worship and prayer. We have. And do you know what? That's where the power is. That's where the power is. Collective worship and praise. Prayer together. Open your mouth. Sing it out. It doesn't matter if it's in tune. It doesn't matter about the music. What matters is that we do it. Because there is power in that. Do you know, the prison was shaken by praise. The prison was shaken. Enemies are defeated by praise. And we have been silenced. We've been silenced for two years. Oh, we can't sing. You see, England play cricket, don't they? It's all cricket in England. And what I mean by cricket is we play by the rules. If they say don't do it, don't do it. India doesn't play by the rules. Um, they play cricket, but, you know, the society is not quite the same. And, and you know, it amazed me. We had, we had a conference in the midst of COVID. Oh, we only had 200. 
because that's a small crowd in India. So a small, a small gathering is 200. And I had to smile to myself because, you know, my parents can't go to church if more than 30 people have applied to go because we can only get 30 in. The building seats 400, but we can only manage 30 at a time. And if you come, you can't sing, you can't speak. And, and, you, and my mother says, well, I'm not sure what the point of going is, really. If you, can't, if you can't pray and you can't speak and you can't worship, well, you, what, what are we doing? No, no, no. Praise, thanksgiving and prayer out of our heart, alive. In India, they just carry on. They come to church, take the mask off and start. And, uh, you know, now, you know, we all have to have our own common sense and, and be sensible about things. But you know what? There is a place for spiritual bravery, courage, take courage, because God's telling us to start crying out, to start praising, to start giving thanks. He's saying, you need to do it, because the church has been silenced, and that is the power of the church. They've taken all the rest of the straw. They've taken away all the social things. They've taken away all the practical things, but they have not yet managed to shut us up. Although COVID has come pretty close, yeah. pretty close. It's really interesting because um, Serena, my friend, was telling me down in Norwich, you know, they, they restri reduced restrictions. And, you know, you can do a little bit more of this and you can do a little bit more of that. But they never, ever mentioned you could start singing in church again. It was just sort of left off the list. How convenient. She said, we've decided we're going to do it anyway now. We're going to do it anyway. We've been quiet long enough. We need to. The church needs to exercise its voice to praise, to pray collectively, to shake the powers of the enemy. And the other thing is, keep your eyes on this. Keep your eyes and ears on this, because this is the truth. And you don't know if anything you're being told is the truth anymore. This is the truth. I want to encourage you. Israel went down into Egypt, powerful and important. And in a period of time, they lost it, even though they became more numerous. But in the midst of trouble, God saved them. And we're not to look back. We're to look forward. We're looking forward to the greatest event ever. I mean, Jesus coming was a great event. Jesus dying was a great event. The resurrection is fantastic. The giving of the Holy Spirit is, you know, beyond measure. But the return of Jesus Christ is going to be much better than that. Let's look forward. Let's expect. Let's be ready. Because he's coming. Hallelujah. I'll stop there.